all of us. <clears throat> and we are on. Uh, hello, oh, everyone. Hi, and welcome to our session uh, with our tonight's webinar with uh, Mr. Peter Asgood, uh, Director of Admission at Harvey Mudd College. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Although you mentioned you've never visited Macedonia, you've been near, and we hope that will happen in, in near future as we do organize these regional college fairs. Uh, so it's a really, it's not that uncommon for universities and colleges to visit our country and present um, their institutions to our students. I'm really happy to see a lot of students um, from different countries tonight for the session. Uh, please feel free to introduce Introduce yourself if you like in the chat box uh, and ask any questions uh, as we go along with the presentation. Uh, Mr. Asgood will answer the questions after the slides, um, or you can just uh, turn on your mic and ask any questions you might have probably during the slides as well. Um, we will talk about the STEM fields tonight. It's a topic that uh, many international students uh, are um, really interested about, at least for, for our students in Macedonia, uh, but we'll discuss it from a perspective of how it is different uh, from what we uh, study at high school uh, in this particular um, uh, majors or courses and how is that different how is it different to study uh, some of the or to major in some of the stem fields in college uh, also we'll talk about why why more people are not um, uh, into the stem fields if that's the case or how to increase that number and what kind of careers are available after you finish a college or university uh, specializing in some of these fields uh, so mr asgood uh, the floor is yours uh, excellent well wonderful to to be to be able to talk with with you all today i'm really looking forward to that it's early in the morning here where i am in southern california i want to take just a, maybe a minute two minutes to tell you a little bit about our school um, among STEM institutions, we're a powerhouse or one of the, a real leader in STEM education in the United States, but we're one of a very small number, perhaps no more than 10 and probably more around five that are also only serving undergraduate students. We have no graduate program whatsoever. And that makes us distinctive in and of itself because it means that all of our enterprise is designed to support and educate and mentor undergraduate students as they then prepare to go on to graduate school or employment. Um, we are a mission-driven institution. Our, we have a very clear mission statement. The person who, we're a young college that founded in the mid 1950s and we're very small with only about 900 students. Uh, so the faculty get to know the students especially well with that small of a number. But our mission is basically to produce well-rounded science and math and engineering people who also understand to and have appreciation for fields not in STEM so they can understand the impact that their work will have on society. And that mission then drives our academic program so that the academic program is, is extremely intentional toward providing that breadth in STEM in fields outside of STEM, and then we cap it off that every student must do research in their major field. Uh, it's a lovely location. We're about 50 kilometers east of downtown Los Angeles, second biggest city in the United States. It's a pleasant uh, temperature, usually hovering in the maybe around 20, 25 to well, it can get quite warm here in the summertime, probably closer to occasionally into the 40s or so. It's also a very diverse student body. It surprises some people that the that the that there's no clear majority of women or men at our school. You will find at least in the United States and probably worldwide that men tend to dominate and are a much larger proportion. And we have been intentional about making sure that doesn't happen. So with that, I'm gonna tell you a bit more about, this is what our presentation is going to cover that Viviana has already mentioned to you. And here we go. Um, it's, STEM is critically important because it interacts with society in various ways. If we think about what we're doing right now, 
this couldn't be possible for if we were not using technology. So uh, think of the way that people communicate. You were mentioning that I have my cell phone. When I was the, the age of the students, there was no way I could imagine that something like this could exist. And so society, society has changed by, uh, by STEM. Right now in our country with this um, businesses being closed because of, of uh, sheltering in place and so on and so forth, the companies that are thriving are the technology companies. And this is going to be a, a interesting change that we'll confront once COVID-19 passes, hopefully soon. But society also changes STEM. Let me tell you about one of my favorite experiences. I was flying across our, our, our country and I met someone who was setting up a political campaign for the next election. And he found out where I worked and he said, oh, we're really interested in your students because we have to model how different people are going to vote depending on their purchasing patterns. Uh, we can look regionally, we can actually split up how this house is gonna dif differ in their voting from that house. So it, some people think that, that you can only be like a, a professor if you major in mathematics or something. And it's just not true. So STEM is affected deeply by political edict, by economic forces, things that happen culturally and socially uh, are very much influencing STEM as well, what direction it should go. So it's, it's an interesting, it's not some standalone discipline, it's very much integrated with the human experience. Um, when you go, at least in the United States, the way courses are instructed can be very different when you get to university. How are they taught differently? They're usually large, large classes, and it's a very efficient way to deliver information if there's one professor lecturing to a large body of people. It's not necessarily the most effective way for a student to learn, but it's a very efficient way which leaves the professor time to go spend more time in the research lab with their research assistants. Um, that, that is the model for many schools, but it's not the, the model for every school. But my point is it, it may be a little bit less personal than a smaller discussion-based course. Again, that's something that would differentiate our college from a lot of others. Um, classes are usually not offered every day. There's usually a rotation where classes might meet at identical times on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for, and there may be a recitation. So you might be a lecture one time, and then the next time that larger group is broken down into smaller units, where there's a little bit more interaction uh, and questions and answers. Uh, lab courses, uh, laboratory courses, are usually taught very, very differently than most at least in the United States, uh, secondary school courses, where if a teacher has merely like say 45 minutes to do a lab, oftentimes the teacher needs to set up the lab for the students so they can spend the time learning the material. In university, that's not gonna be the case. You're gonna have to set up the lab. You're gonna have a partner. And the time that you have is not just 45 minutes or an hour or an hour 15. You may have three and a half hours to do that lab which means you have time to make mistakes, to write your write-up, to make mistakes on your write-up. Uh, and that's, we want to think there's a deeper learning with that. All right, um, it's usually uh, conceptually difficult courses. The courses usually move fast. The problems tend to focus on problem solving. Um, it may, it's often more important to figure out what important questions there are to ask rather than necessarily get the right answer. So think about that, that's a really profound difference, not just getting the answer, being correct, but is this a good question to ask? What's the next question you need to ask? Um, the professor may not discuss material from the text at all. The professor may have written the text. The, the, the point is that the, the professor is gonna depend upon the students to do a lot more independent work to master this material and to come to uh, discussion classes knowing what their questions are. So this next point is particularly important. This is where STEM is, is, I think, quite different from other fields in the social sciences or the humanities or the arts. Many of the courses are sequential. What I mean by that is you cannot get to this point. Let's say you're talking about mathematics. You're not gonna get into differential equations unless you've taken calculus, 
unless you've taken multivariable calculus, and then maybe you can get in. You may even want intermediary to have a linear algebra course to deepen your understanding of differential equations. My point is you're not gonna jump into this class unless you've had these others, so they're prerequisites. And as a result, that seems very vertical to me. Whereas, by contrast, if you were studying politics, you could take a political theory course, an international politics course, uh, perhaps a in the U.S. constitutional law course, all in the same semester. It's more horizontal, uh, and it's much harder to do that in STEM. And as a result, it's a very smart move to start your college career with STEM courses. If you decide it's not for you, hey, no problem. You can make the shift over to any other major. But it is much, much harder to start elsewhere and then jump in and say, oh, now I'm going to be an engineer. The answer may be, no, you're not, or you're going to have to go back almost to the start and spend a lot more time in university. So that se sequencing is very important to consider. And then there's usually some sort of a final exercise that'll vary from school to school. The most common is probably a senior thesis where it is your project and you're going to spend pretty much an entire year, if not longer, studying this one particular um, uh, issue, problem, and you'll have not only oral but written uh, presentations about this that will probably be like writing a small book. So a lot of writing is going to be important for this. Uh, who is in these classes? Uh, at least in this country, um, it tends to attract students who are very confident and very passionate about the subject and the way that courses might be set up if you have a, if you tracked to a, let's say a biology course, large numbers of students, you may want to find out who's going to be successful in this. And you set a very high standard because your department can only accommodate X number of students and you have X plus 30 or so, and you need to be able to work with only, only X. So there may be more demanding courses and require students to be more resilient and to have frankly, uh, small failures along the way small failures. And, to, and so a, a key point in this is that it's very important for students to develop habits of working together. Um, there was a study done at the massive University of California at Berkeley about why students, some students were being successful in math courses and other students were not. And they tried to study it demographically by what school the students came from. None of it proved to be uh, the case. What tended to make the difference is the students on their own initiative took effort to work together because there's just simply better ways of learning when you have other voices involved in it. The other is it's, it's actually a sign of strength. Professors love it when you ask them for help. You ask them, for, you ask them good questions, questions that show that you've done some thinking about this and, and give it an effort on your own rather than please bail me out. But persevering is very important because of the rigor of the, of the course. Um, why don't more people go into STEM? Uh, there are all kinds of reasons why you would, but a lot of people perceive it as being some sort of isolated uh, field when it's not, that it's not helping other people, when in fact, it absolutely does. Who's involved right now in studying COVID-19? Everybody, but particularly people in various areas of STEM, and they all can contribute to this. Um, but we also have societal messages. So for you students particularly, but also for anyone who's watching, I have a, a I know we won't be able to pull this off as if we were um, face to face, but I, I'd like you to indulge me for, for just a moment. Close your eyes and I'm gonna have you imagine in your own mind, a mathematician working very hard on a difficult proof. All right, so think of that image and think of, think of this now, Open up your eyes and pay attention. Was the person you were imagining male? The answer is for most people is gonna be yes. And in this country, it's overwhelmingly people who are either white like me or Asian. And so there's a disturbing message about who we think can do this, particularly math, because math is like the, the language of science. So there's some very outdated perspectives about who can do STEM. And in this country, we feel you have to be almost touched by God to be able to do math. And it's just not true. It takes a lot more hard work. My example of that is in this country, if a young person wants to learn how to play football, soccer, the first time they kick the ball, are they able to bend the ball? Of course not. It takes practice. Can you play 
the, the, the cello the first time you pick up the bow. No, you have to practice. So, so STEM is like that, practice. Um, here's some good things about STEM careers. There's collaboration everywhere. Um, if you're doing research and you live in Macedonia, someone in Italy, someone in Russia, someone in Argentina might be interested in your work and you may be collaborating. Uh, so, and as a result, communication skills are critically important. Um, one of the things I find very appealing professionally about STEM is it's particularly good at identifying people who can, who have good ideas and can lead projects. So there's a very efficient delivery system for people to rise in the profession quickly. And I find that very appealing. Um, I mentioned before about the vertical versus horizontal uh, in your academic courses. It's also the case that salaries tend to be high in this country in job creation. There's 60% more new jobs in STEM than in any other, any other field. And I will tell you for our school, the, the median starting salary for the students who have just graduated uh, a year ago is a little over $100,000 per year. So that's a very high salary for someone who's just coming out of university with a bachelor's degree only. Uh, but they're problem solvers. So I mentioned this business of closing your eyes about, about whether you might imagine a male or a, or a female doing this math proof. Uh, this is another graphic to el illustrate my point about the disparities about who does STEM. And uh, here's a, a, a small chart to show you what I uh, am graphically to see what we're talking about. It's a little bit dated information. We haven't had a more recent study done. But if you look down in the bottom two levels, that's, that's unhealthy for an economy. Because if you want problem solvers who look at problems from various perspectives and your lived experience are going to contribute to your solution. And if only one out of five people are women in that group, not a good deal. Um, and this plays out even more uh, problematic in racial matters. And certainly that's been in the news a lot in this country. We have really significant problems about race in this country. Here's another idea. I come from a school that, and I'm certainly biased in, the, in putting this slide in front of you, but statistically, smaller colleges and independent rather than the large state-run universities tend to do a better job in retaining people in STEM and giving them the support and nurturing they need so they can continue and graduate on time. And here's a graphic for that, uh, some evidence for that. It's, it's, it's pretty significant differences to me. And um, so there's, there's a real value. Oftentimes what are called liberal arts colleges in the United States are overlooked for STEM and they should not be because the sciences are an integral part of, of uh, liberal arts. Um, having a broad education is very important. Um, here's, a, here's an example of that. Uh, at least in this country, usually the first laboratory science course a student will take in secondary school is biology. And it's almost the reverse of what you think you might want to do, where understanding physics as the sort of the, the building block for all the sciences is critically important, even if you're going to study biology. Knowing how chemistry bonds atoms together is going to be fundamental to your understanding of biology. And as I mentioned, math is the language of science. A computer is going to be involved. So if you merely study one field, you could become quite narrow in the, in the kinds of problems you can solve later on. And you'll give yourself more and more opportunity if you broaden your STEM education. Uh, and no, no doubt that technology will change what, what it's going to look like 15 years from now. Well, who can know that? Uh, but it will be something different. And it'll be something very exciting. Um, so how to prepare. Uh, you may be in a rigid curriculum. I don't know enough about the education system that each of you might be uh, dealing with. It is important to have, to try to take calculus in the final year of high school. Um, calculus is usually a linchpin course to get into the university level physics courses. And, and, and frankly, the way at our school we teach chemistry is actually calculus based. Learning to communicate 
in various channels is also very important. I really can't overemphasize this. If you're, if you are great at STEM and you can't connect it to people, you're going to diminish your cap capability. Uh, so I really think that having this breadth is very important. Again, acknowledging I'm tremendously biased about that point of view. Um, a lot of people think that you should take just overload as much as possible, and it's not healthy for you to do that. We want you to be successful, have good confidence, to be resilient, to push yourself, but we do not demand that you take every single hard course that you possibly can. It's actually important to have some life experiences that balance you out. So do as well as you can, maintain your grades. There are some extracurricular activities that can expose you specifically to STEM. And I think one will find that there are more and more that are shifting to some virtual or online way of, of exposing students. And I have some ideas in mind of some that are very, very good. Some that are directed toward a certain type of demographic population than others. Many colleges and universities probably not this summer, but hopefully returning next summer, we'll have summer programs. And that can give you an exposure, uh, a deeper exposure to take perhaps a computer science course is one, if one is not offered in your school or your country, um, that now you know a little bit about what you're getting into there or a deeper laboratory course or something like that. And there may be people you can talk to who can give you insight about what their professional lives are really like, and that can be very helpful. So with that, for you EdUSA counselors, I've given you a link here if you'd like to join our, our uh, mailing list for a newsletter, electronic newsletter we send out, uh, please do so. For you students, um, you can go to our website and there's actually, when you go to that website, go to the admissions section and on the left side, you will see a inquiry form and you can join our inquiry list and we'll be glad to send you newsletters other information, uh, in particular for a student who might want to apply to our school, we're going to be constantly updating about decisions that we're making about whether or not we're going to acquire certain tests or uh, whether we're going to open in the fall. I think the chances are good that we will, uh, so on and so forth. So it's a good way, if you, if you are sincerely interested in my college, please take the initiative to, to join in. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you all and interact with you so that I can uh, have the questions with you. And I'm going to have to change my screen here just a second. Come on. Um, am I still with you? There we go. Yes, with you. Excellent. Hey, I pulled it off. For an old person like me, that's really, I, I should get, I, you know, well, well done, Mr. Oskin. All right. So, um, I am ready to deal with questions, and I hope I'm doing okay on time. Hi, can I ask you a question? Please. First, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask about the college you're uh, from, uh, sorry, uh, the Harry Mudd College. Could you please tell more about your majors? And I'm personally interested in the engineering majors. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that, please? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, our college is not a good model <laughs> for you to understand what's going on in the United States for STEM because we're a very, very peculiar place. I mean that in a very affectionate way, but we're, we're different. Um, what is a classic model is that some universities if, you, if it's a big university and they can only accommodate a certain number of students in that major, they may have students apply specifically to that major and they may be selective about who can join that particular field. And, in, in, and you asked specifically about engineering, um, there's usually a different type of engineering. Electrical engineering is one, is one uh, department the mechanical engineers have another department. The um, chemical engineers or civil engineers all have different components. So it's it's almost like silos, separate you know separate separate parts of it. Our college is very different. Uh, first of all, we will not. We care so much about breadth first, with having a broad STEM education that regardless of what major a student might want to go into 
We're not going to hold them to that, uh, that expectation. And we will not allow them to choose a major even in their first year. Then, if they decide to go into engineering, we offer one major in engineering that covers all those branches. And the student can then focus within the engineering major toward mechanical or electrical or civil or chemical or biomedical, or whatever field you'd like. But it was going to be more common is that there may be a more selective program to apply for this engineering program than this other engineering program, or it might be that if you, it's, it's much easier to get in if you're going to be a philosophy major than a STEM major. I hope that, does that make sense to you when I say it that way? Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm looking at some of the other questions. What is the most, uh, oh, so our majors are 10. There are six that are tied to departments, biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics, computer science, engineering. And then we have four combination majors, biology and chemistry together, math and computer science together, a um, math and physics major for students who might be interested in say string theory. And then we have one that's really interesting and we're one of uh, three or four schools in the United States that pull this off at, for undergraduates. It's mathematical and computational biology. So how might that, a student studying that, be able to contribute to something like uh, COVID-19 battles? They're perfectly situated. For that. Um, do we strong, require strong math academic accomplishments? It's more about the student's curricular preparation. I don't think we're going to be looking to see who's done which competition necessarily better than another. Um, what's more important to our school is the student fits our culture. They, they agree with our position that they want to have breadth in their studies. And there are a good number of students who are really exceptional STEM people who don't want that. And so we don't fit them and we're really not interested. In but other colleges, you can be, uh, there are some other schools that say, we want the most talented student in X discipline, and they don't have to be rounded, and they may want to choose that kind of a student. So it really depends on what institution you're referring to. It's, it's not that we paint all, one of the strengths of the United, education, United States education system is just the sheer range of types of institutions that we make available. And they're very, very different places. So it, unfortunately requires a lot of homework on the part of the student to figure out which school might suit them best. And so if I can take that one step further, I really invite you students to do a self-exploration, understand what you like to learn, how you like to learn it, with whom you like to learn, and then use that information to try and find colleges that connect to you, rather than you trying to figure out what does this college want for me? What does another college want for me? And you can turn yourself almost into a pretzel trying to be all these different things. It's just not a good, not a good deal for you. All right, so that went off on all kinds of runs there. Um, scholarships for Harvey Mudd College. For an international student, unfortunately, we, do, we, do, we can accommodate a small number of students, but we have a very limited budget for international students. And unfortunately, that makes the situation extremely competitive because we will only admit a student who either has his or her own funding or that we, is one of the small number that we choose to fund with, this, with the limited budget money that we have. So um, that is unfortunately the process. I wish we were uh, able to fund just about any student, no matter whether they're coming from Macedonia or Australia or Southern California. Do we have summer courses available? Yes, we do, but the intended audience is university students, not so much secondary school students. But there are actual courses, and a Harvey Mudd student would get credit for them. So yes, we do offer them. Uh, this summer, they're all online, and they're actually nearly, uh, some of them are actually finishing because they're very intense three-week or six-week programs, and, and a couple of them are finishing up very really quickly. Um, good question, Andre. Um, are there any ABET accredited programs? Our engineering program is ABET accredited. What does that mean? Accrediting Board of Engineering Technology, ABET. And it is in this country, the one that says that your engineering program uh, is approved and as a result, your chances of gaining employment right out uh, of the engineering program are extremely high. Employers know it. 
you, you, you're, you're trained as an engineer. There's another piece to it. You typically take an exam in your final year of university called the engineer in training exam. And it makes it very easy to get your uh, practitioner's license in engineering if you, if you do that. Uh, another question from Kate, is the SAT Math 2 subject test recommended or required? If, you, if this question had come up last year, the answer would have been yes. This year, the answer is no, and it's not about COVID. It is a decision by our institution that predated COVID that we are no longer going to even consider SAT subject tests. So some students who may have taken that test and said, hey, I've got a 790 score out of 800 on the math too. Uh, we're not gonna look at it. So we wanna be, this is an equity issue. Not everyone has access to the preparation for that test. It's a culturally biased test. Uh, there's all, there are many, many reasons <laughs> but we are not going to, we're gonna block that test score from coming into our view as much as possible when we evaluate students. Anastasia says, since you said that students don't have a particular major in their first year at our college, at other schools, yes. Um, what subjects do they take? Well, this is where the students at our college take a broad math and science education. We have a core curriculum. And what that re requires of a student is two mathematics courses, it's single and multivariable calculus, that's one course, and it's linear algebra, leading students to differential equations is the next course that many of them will take. It's a lovely, really, really cool course in computer science. It's two courses in physics, including starting students off, this is gonna sound crazy, with special relativity theory. Uh, so we want you to think like a physicist thinks, right? Um, there's a year-long chemistry course. There is a, um, or not year-long, it's a semester-long chemistry course. And there's another course that's a more of a quantitatively based biology course because our biology students come into that class already having learned how to code and having, having taken multivariable calculus. So we can take that biology course and play with it in a really exciting way. And then there's another course in the core that is dealing with your impact on society there is a writing intensive course, actually two of them, and there's a final course in engineering that is a systems engineering course, but it is disguised as an, as an underwater robotics treasure hunt. It is a really, really cool course. Not an easy course, but it's a really cool course. So that is our core curriculum. All, almost all those courses are gonna be taken in the student's first year and as a consequence, they have less elective freedom than they might enjoy at other institutions, but it also puts them on a platform from which they can select any major and be successful in any one of them. And it helps them see connections across academic fields. It, it allows the faculty to know, as I was using the example of biology, that students are coming into my class knowing this material already, so I can take advantage of that and teach these ways. And even more important, the probably the most important piece of it, and I really can't overemphasize this, we want students to learn, to learn collaboratively. And since students are pretty much taking identical courses in their first year, they seek each other out to study together. And that's a great habit to, to uh, embed in the students. As an ex a further, to d further deepen that, we have made a policy at the first semester, not the first year, but the fall term for a first time student is past no credit, there's no grades. And we want students to just focus on learning how to learn our way rather than having the performance pressure uh, time them down. So that, that these are some of the ways that our college is distinctive. There's another really, really different, <laughs> oh my gosh, how to get into this. This is gonna be really messy. We're, we're a college it's a very small school, but we're not alone. Because if I were on our campus, I could walk probably no more than a minute and be on another college's campus. We're in a, a consortium, a group, a neighborhood of seven colleges, five of them only serving undergraduates. And the students at one college can eat meals, make friends, take courses at the other colleges. So the total population of undergraduates is about 6,000, and we're about 900 of that number, so we're the smallest and most focused school. 
that gives our students many, many, many more opportunities, range and depth that just makes a very sweet deal for the students in our school. So, boy, I've been talking really fast. I hope that's not been too fast for you. It looks like there's some more questions coming up here. Um, the workload in college is greater often. I don't know enough about your high school load to make a comparison. Um, should you do something specifically to prepare? We actually send students over the summer some study materials that they might brush up on. I'm, as an example, our chemistry faculty anticipate that most students coming into their first uh, fall semester have forgotten the chemistry that they took. And so we give them some, some ways to brush up or in mathematics to make sure their foundations are strong uh, in areas like pre-calculus, limits, functions, and so they can get through the calculus a bit better. Um, so there are some things you can do. I really like Khan Academy. Uh, there are other tools out there, but Khan Academy is a very, very good one. And I believe it's, it's free to United States students. I hope it's free for you as well. Uh, so those are things I would endorse. Considering we're a STEM school, we are, are that. Uh, is it possible to take a minor or maybe double major in the humanities? Oh, I love this, Mila. That's a great question. The answer is defined, decidedly yes. So we actually require that of you. <laughs> uh, you we, we insist that every student at our school takes just short of a minor, we call it a concentration, in a field that the student chooses that is not in STEM. It could be in classics, it could be in music, it could be in dance, it could be in politics, economics is the most popular. Uh, it could be psychology, anthropology, Latin American studies, anything you want to do. And in uh, completing this, very, very likely that you will take courses both at Harvey Mudd College and at the other colleges in our group. So yes, you would, you would absolutely do that. Uh, you could double major. That's more work to double major. Um, we're trying to make it so the students don't overload themselves where they have more time to pursue other interests. Uh, is it common? Not very many students double major, but 100% of our students take courses at our neighboring colleges, and 100% of them must take some concentration. So, we have sports teams or clubs, particularly for volleyball. Yes, uh, we have a men's volleyball club, and we have a women's volleyball varsity team that is in our division of college sports is ranked usually in the top five in the nation. It's a very strong program. Uh, and we have outdoor sand courts. It's warm where we are, so we can do outdoor volleyball quite comfortably as well. Have we offered full scholarships to international students? We do offer them to a small number of students. Um, so my point is that if a student is going to need financial assistance, we're going to determine that we can admit a small number of all of those students and we'll admit them and fund them as much as they require. But it means that we won't admit virtually everyone else. So that's how we operate. How much is tuition and fees for, for, for students? It's, we'd have no, the only, only real difference in, for an international student has to deal with transportation and perhaps getting health insurance. But it's this, for the, enterprise of the education, it is principally the exact same cost for a student from Macedonia as it would be from a student from San Jose, California. And uh, so, and that number is very, very high. It's an, it's, this is one of the most expensive schools in the entire United States. The total cost for living on campus, eating, uh, your own personal expenses, books, tuition is about 80,000 US dollars per year. And so that's why the vast majority of international students are applying for financial aid. That said, there are some students whose families, bless them, do have those resources. And uh, it's about 9% of our students are international students. Do you have an astrophysics? Um, the astrophysics is blended into the physics major or a student might, if they're interested really on the sort of uh, more sort of the theoretical side, might go toward the math and physics combination. But we do not have a standalone astrophysics major. We have very broad majors, rather like I was describing with the case of engineering where we have one major rather than 12 or so. Um, the resources are great. 
Uh, there is a uh, uh, observatory with a 10 and a, and a 12 inch telescope. That's about a third of a meter, a little less than. Um, and uh, there is another telescope about um, a 90 minute drive away. It has a one meter telescope. And that's really exciting. And almost only undergraduates ever get to use it. So it's a really good resource for our students. Um, so yes, we, a very strong program for, for astronomy within the broader physics major. So the way we tend to approach our majors is we, we, we go for this breadth. We have a set of required courses for that, for every student in that major. And then the student gets to elect with, with a great deal of freedom if they want to go one particular direction or they want to go three different directions within that major. And we just really open it up to the students and do a lot of mentoring and the research program. So if I can, I, I, you're asking me a lot of questions about Harvey Mudd College, which that's great. I was hoping to, I was anticipating that I'd be asked to speak much more about STEM more generally, but maybe my, my presentation covered that. Here's one other thing that we do that is absolutely special. So I mentioned that usually there's a final exercise like a senior thesis. And that is true at Harvey Mudd for students who study in laboratory based disciplines like chemistry, or biology, or in highly theoretical fields like the pure mathematicians and pure physicists, theoretical physicists. For a student who wants to study engineering, for a student who wants to study computer science, instead of doing a senior thesis, we put them into teams of five students working on a live project for a, a, a project sponsored by an outside entity, usually a corporation. And these are corporations like Toyota, SpaceX, Facebook, they matter. If it, it could be um, uh, the City of Hope, which is a cancer research center about 20 minutes away from us. And our students now, th these companies have paid us as an institution, they paid the college about $50,000. And they very much would like a return on that investment. So the students now have a deliverable to that company by May 1st. So it's a really, really exciting program. Um, an example of that, two, I'll give you two examples. One is our students found a way in using, when, when people ride roller coasters, to capture the energy that it comes from the machine when the, when the cart is breaking to slow down to, to end the ride, capturing that energy and recirculating it to send the next one on. So it then creates this green energy roller coaster ride. That was fantastic. The students loved it because they had to ride roller coasters and they snuck onto them all these kind of accelerometers and all this kind of cool stuff. Another project is a way for a, uh, our students built a, a small device about the size of a stapler. And uh, it would be an all in one tool, cylindrical device that allows a surgeon to remove brain tumors in a less invasive fashion than currently exists. So the incision in the scalp would only be about this big and then wires inside the device can wiggle through crevices of the brain to the tumor rather than scooping out brain matter, chop the tumor up into tiny pieces, extract the pieces, irrigate the system, cauterize the system, and it's out. And the beauty is everything, every piece of that is, is plastic, which allows the doctor to keep the MRI working in real time while they're performing the surgery. And our students built that. It's crazy to do that as an undergrad. And so we do this really cool stuff for students in this clinic program. Do we have study abroad programs? We absolutely do. It is harder, I should have mentioned this, is harder at most schools to be a STEM major and to study abroad. You need to usually move courses around a little bit so you can accommodate being away for a semester. Uh, it may also be the case that you might look at summer study abroad uh, programs rather than for the full academic semester. But we do have about 25% of our students who do study abroad programs, and that's actually very high for STEM institutions. It's not as high as traditional liberal arts colleges who have students who are studying, you know, German or international relations or something. And yes, if they're receiving financial aid, that goes with them to their study abroad program. So the family pays the same amount that it would for a semester at Harvey Mudd College, and they simply have this experience elsewhere. Uh, those researches. The clinic program is only for, it's for seniors 
And uh, in engineering, the students do actually three semesters of this. They do one term of their junior year and two terms of their senior year. The thesis is typically, yes, a, a, a final exercise, a fourth year of university. And that is much more uniform uh, across the country to have a senior thesis. This, this clinic program is, uh, I, I think it's unique. I think we're literally the only school in the United States that pulls it off this year. Um, all right. So, Biliana, you told me this is going to be 45 minutes, and I think, uh, yes. <laughs> and I've been talking a mile a minute. I apologize to you. I've wanted to put so much in, and I'm afraid that I spoke very quickly, and it may make it make you want to go back and listen to it on the recording. But if I have spoken too quickly, I apologize. It's over enthusiasm and wanting to squeeze in as much as I possibly could. Peter, it was perfect. Thank you very much for the time uh, and for all the information you provided. Uh, it was really interesting to hear uh, so many specific details about, about Harimad as well, uh, about STEM fields and uh, future, pros uh, f future um, opportunities for students. Uh, I beginning when we discussed this session um, that their students are very much interested in this uh, in this field uh, and they are familiar with very much as it is as all right during the session so uh, thank you again and thank you everyone for participating for your great questions uh, this session will be shared on our website and uh, on our Facebook page uh, with everyone uh, who wants to listen to it again or want to share with other students or advisors as well Thanks thank you again. so much thank you so Best much good luck to you all um, if you have more specific questions you've seen my email I'll be more than happy to interact with you up to you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you.